Hello, my name is Brittany Jones and I am currently a postgraduate student at the University of St. Andrews working under Professor Vincent Yannick for my PhD. Thank you for attending my webinar. I was very grateful to receive the Mass Huey Bridge Grant, which supported a recent stay at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, where I worked with Dr. Leila Sayeg, and this webinar will outline some of the preliminary results from that study. Before we get started, I ask that you turn your volumes up on your computers, as there are a lot of sound bites included in this presentation. So, jumping right in. The title of this webinar is Stop Copying Me, How Male Bottlenose Dolphins Communicate. Let's briefly chat about what communication is. Communication is simply a sender sending a signal to a receiver through some medium, with the goal being that the receiver understands the signal's message. These signals can come from a range of modalities. For example, signals can be tactile, chemical, olfactory, electrical, visual, and acoustic. Successful communication is imperative to the survival of group living species. Knowing the meaning of a signal is also important on multiple levels. For example, a signal might mean something to you and your partner, which means something completely different to the rest of the group. There are also signal differences as the, at the group and population level. For example, this simple hand signal, depending on who you are interacting with, may have very different meanings. While we could talk all day about communication, for the purposes of this presentation, we focus on the acoustic communication modality. Many species rely on sound production for efficient communication. Here are a few examples. This modality has many benefits for both in-air and in-water communication because sound can travel further than the eye can see. It can be perceived in the dark or visually occluded areas such as turbid waters or dense forests. The bottlenose dolphin communication system is arguably one of the most well-studied of the marine mammals. We know that they have many types of acoustic signals, and for simplicity's sake, we will call these vocalizations throughout the presentation. Dolphin vocalizations are typically broken into three categories. They use echolocation clicks for navigation, burst pulses, which are made up of fast repetition clicks and are used in many social contexts, but we are going to focus on the third vocal category, the whistle. This sound is tonal and is frequency modulated or changes up and down in pitch over time. Bottlenose dolphins have what are termed signature whistles, which are individually specific whistles that are used most often by an animal when separated from their group and likely contains information about the animal's identity. Each animal's signature whistle takes a different shape when viewed in a spectrogram, which displays the whistle as a function of frequency and pitch over time. So you can see these three animal signature whistles sound very different. That way they know who's calling when they are separated. When we're looking at these spectrograms, the y-axis is the frequency in kilohertz, and the time is in seconds on the x-axis. The darkness of the lines represent how loud the sound is. The shape of the whistle, while very stable over time, also has variation in some of the whistle parameters that are less understood, but likely incorporate other information about the animal, such as their behavioral and emotional states. For example, here are two signature whistles from the same animal. While you see that the overall shape or contour remains consistent, we can also see that there are small variations in certain characteristics. This is an exciting area for researchers to try and better understand if these variations are just a function of biological error, sort of like if I repeated the same word five times. There would be subtle variation in my pitch and in my voice, or if these changes carry specific information in the signal. For example, if you were to ask me the question, what animal is this presentation about? And I answered, dolphins. Or if I answered, dolphins? 
While I'm saying the same word in both responses, you likely perceive different information from both answers, such as in the second one, I did not seem to be confident and responded in a more questioning format than the first time where I seemed confident in my response. These signature whistles are learned, not innate, and dolphins typically develop crystal, crystallized signature whistles in the first few weeks after life. They do this by incorporating the sounds in their environment and creating a call specific to themselves. In this video, we show a calf prior to establishing its signature whistle, swimming around its mom, whistling many different sounds, similar to babbling in human infants. Dolphins have become an interesting model species to compare to humans as they vocally learn as human infants do, incorporating sounds of their environment and socially reinforced sounds into their adult repertoire. While that dolphin calf is really cute, what is possibly more interesting is their ability to be vocally flexible across their lifespan. So let's consider another human language process that may be used by dolphins, convergence. This is Brittany. Hello. She's from the convergence in dolphins, we want to look at the whistle contours more closely. When analyzing whistle contours, researchers can look at many whistle characteristics, which we will talk a lot about in the results. So here you can see that from this spectrogram, we can measure whistle parameters such as the beginning frequency, end frequency, maximum frequency, minimum frequency, the frequency range, and the duration of the signal, and these are just some of the basic characteristics that make up this unique contour. In order to do this, I studied five male pairs in Sarasota Bay, Florida. Here, they have a yearly annual capture release program where they capture small groups of dolphins in order to monitor the health of the population. During these captures, researchers affix a suction cup with a hydrophone to the melon of the dolphins so that we can record their vocalizations during these events. We know that the dolphins emit their signature whistles more than any other whistles during these captures. 
and this project has an ongoing signature whistle catalog of each animal collected for over 30 years. The pairs were only included if they were captured together more than once. They are named with numbers, so you can see the names of the dolphins are on the left, 14 and 94, 142 and 276, etc. We also know how long it has been since their last capture and the animal's ages, so we can see if there are any effects on the, of these variables on the dolphins doing the converging. The whistles were considered to have converged if the two dolphins' whistle parameter was significantly different during the first capture together, but not significantly different during the second capture together. We also considered it convergence if the specific whistle parameter was different between the two animals in both captures, but at least one dolphin's parameter significantly changed from one capture to the next, and that change made that parameter more similar to that of the other dolphin during the second capture. So, what we haven't looked at in the past are the whistle parameters that are important to this convergence. What parameters become more similar to each other's over time? So I'm going to show you a series of graphs. This, to start on the left here, you can see that we're looking at beginning frequency. The y-axis is frequency in hertz, so 0 to 35,000 hertz, or 35 kilohertz. And the year captured is on the x-axis, so you can see each small graph indicates an alliance pair. For example, if we start at the left, we're looking at a graph of dolphin 14 and 94 in their captures in 1992 and then in 1993. In order to see convergence, we want to see if their mean, uh, which is the black line in the middle of the boxes, become more similar from capture 1 to capture 2. Now I'm going to box these graphs to make it a little bit more easier to follow. The blue box represents a whistle parameter that was already the same in the first capture. So if we look at dolphin pair 4 that's highlighted right now, you can see that their means are pretty similar in 2009, and they stayed pretty similar in 2012. So we're not looking for convergence in them because they're already the same. The yellow boxes represent pairs that didn't change over time. So you can see, uh, if you look at pair, the second pair there, that in 2012, they had very different beginning frequencies, and in 2014, they still had very different frequencies, and neither animal really changed. The green boxes represent animals that converged on that whistle parameter. So you can see in pair 1 and pair 5 um, that the beginning frequency of their whistle contours became significantly more similar from the first capture and the second capture. Pair 5 is a great example of that. You can see that Dolphin 178 and 188 were very different in 2008, but come 2016 had almost exactly the same mean. Now if we look at end frequency, similarly we don't see a very big trend. Again, Pair 4 was already very similar in the first capture and didn't change. Pair 2 was already different in the first capture and didn't change. We again have some convergence in pairs 1 and 5. And then pair 3 actually showed our first instance of divergence. If you look at pair 3 here, 36 and 38, in 1992 their means were not very extremely different. But in 1993 and 1995 they actually became more dissimilar. So we call that divergence. Again, in end frequency, we don't have a trend. We've got a little bit of everything. But when we look at maximum frequency, we have one pair, pair, pair 2, dolphins 142 and 276, who were already similar in 2012 and remained similar in 2014. And the other four dolphin pairs all showed convergence um, from their first to their last capture. We see a very obvious trend that maximum frequency is an important parameter in convergence. Minimum frequency it does not show the same trend. As you can see, we have one pair that was already very similar in the first capture, one pair that was already was different in the first capture and remained different across captures, two instances of convergence, 
and one instance of divergence. So again, no greater than chance trend here. But in frequency range, similar to maximum frequency, we have two pairs that were the similar in their first capture and stayed similar in the second capture, and three pairs that showed convergence over time. Again, with an overwhelming trend uh, that all five of these pairs had more similar whistles in their last capture than they did in their first capture. Finally, we look at duration. Duration, we had one pair that had very similar durations in their first capture and also similar durations in their second capture. We had one subtle convergence in dolphin pair four, but you can see the means are still quite different and they have a pretty large standard error for their duration. What's interesting is the other three dolphin pairs actually all showed divergence in their duration. So they became more dissimilar over time. I know there was a lot to take in, so let's summarize. Here we see that beginning frequency, end frequency, and minimum frequency did not show any trends greater than chance and did not seem to be manipulated by the dolphins to be more or less similar than their ally over time. Maximum frequency and frequency range showed clear trends suggesting that the dolphins converge on these whistle parameters to make them more similar over time. Finally, duration showed a 75% divergence rate from their mate over captures. When we take a closer look at these changes, we order our pairs in terms of how long it was between captures. So how much time did they have um, in between these two captures to, to go through these converging or diverging phases? We see that at the top there, pair 14 and 94, even though they were only, there was only one year between the two captures, there is ample time for convergence between the pair in just that first year. It is interesting to see that when there was eight years between recordings at the bottom for 178 and 188, all of the whistle parameters of the two dolphins were similar in the second capture. We do have two pairs with three years between captures that show varying results, which suggests that years as allies is not the only important variable here. Next, we need to look at the coefficients of association between these pairs. While we know that because the animals are captured together, they were found swimming together in multiple years, we need to look closer at how much time they typically associate to get a clearer picture of this relationship. So this will be one of our next steps as we are getting that data soon. Now we wanted to see, does one dolphin move towards the whistle of another, or do they both get more similar over time? In eight out of the 14 instances of convergence, it was both animals becoming more similar to one another. Divergence also seemed to be facilitated by both animals. For the instances that both animals did not change and it was only one animal facilitating the convergence, we wanted to see if there was an impact on age. If we start at the top, we have one instance of 14 converging towards 94. And 14 is three years younger than 94. So maybe it's that the younger animal moves towards the older. But for 178 and 188, 178 is the one typically moving closer to 188. And 178 is actually a year older than 188. Now, for 164 and 242, they're actually the same age. And 242 moves closer to 164 in two of the cases. So we don't see any effect of age. This may be because most of these animals are very close in age, as the greatest difference is only three years be between them. Therefore, if it is not age that is causing these shifts, maybe there's an effect of dominance or hierarchy um, in these pairs that is affecting what animal copies one another. While we know what components are converging over time, the next step is to see if the two animal signature whistle shapes or contours become more similar over time. We are going to do this using Signal 5.0, where we input the spectrogram and cross-correlate the contours at every point along the contour by sliding the two whistles past one another. At the point where they are the most similar, we will keep that correlation coefficient for those two whistles, and this will be the similarity score. This way, we can look for changes in similarity score between animals from capture one to capture two to see if the overall shape is actually getting closer together or further apart. Now why 
might parameter analysis matter? Why not just look at the overall contour? Well, for example, if we found, as we did, that maximum frequency is a whistle parameter that becomes more similar, whereas minimum frequency tends to remain the same, this might suggest that minimum frequency may have an importance for individual recognition, whereas maximum frequency may encode a group membership signal. Now, this is just a first step. In order to say this for sure, we would need a larger sample size and would need to incorporate playbacks manipulating these parameters to see if it holds true. But understanding what aspects of these sounds carry important information for survival in these species is an imperative thing for their conservation. Let's bring it back to the cartoon world to explore this data, this idea. Noise pollution across the world's oceans has skyrocketed over the past 100 years, and with the advances of technology and ease of transportation, it does not appear to be slowing down. Some of the largest sources of anthropogenic noise are ships, air gun firing during seismic surveys, construction noise such as the production of large wind farms, and military sonar and blasting. Just a few of the impacts of noise on marine mammals are increased stress hormones, deafness, changes in swim or migration patterns, mass strandings, and even death from tissue damage as a result of avoidance dives. Masking occurs when both the signal and masking noise have similar frequencies and overlap. Mid-frequency military sonar is emitted between 1 and 10 kilohertz. As you can see here, largely masking L's signature whistle and likely affecting his ability to communicate and reconnect with Fiji. Continued investigation of marine mammal communication systems is the only way to truly understand the full impact of ocean noise and to influence real change in reducing noise pollution and keeping these incredible animals safe. I would like to take one moment to thank a few organizations that made this project possible. First, thank you to the Marine Alliance for Science and Technology for the grant that supported this research. My supervisor and co-author, Professor Vincent Yannick, Dr. Leila Sayeg for hosting me at Woods Hole and for access to this rich data set, and Dr. Randy Wells and the Sarasota Research Program for their tireless work monitoring and recording this wild population of dolphins. Now I'd like to invite you to ask any questions you might have, and I'll read them aloud and hopefully provide an answer. So we have one question. Uh, does the signature whistle stay throughout their lives? It's a good question. Um, yes, it does. They, once it's crystallized, it tends to remain the same throughout their life with pretty minimal uh, changes. But as we can see here, they, they can have differences across a signature whistle for different contexts, um, and there can be some subtle changes depending on their social affiliations and things throughout their life. All right, well, thank you so much for attending. Have a great day.